God's Word raised up real high and proud. You're not ashamed of God's Word. And in your God's Word, your copy, turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 is where we'll be today. As we're continuing our sermon series in the book of Acts called Do It Again, Lord, Do It Again. We're learning what Jesus did to His apostles and the Holy Spirit in the first 30 years of the church and how it applies to us today at the Mission Church of Lexington. God's truths and God's way never changes. The message today in chapter 4 is entitled, Boldness, Not Blandness. As the video showed, there's great needs, amen? The need is as great as it's ever been. People need hope. People need grace. People need mercy. People need salvation, amen? But the question is, are we as bold as we need to be? Are we as intentional as we need to be as a church and as individual Christians to reach a lost and dying world? I fear far too often we are bland, we are lackadaisical, we're lukewarm with what God's called us to do. I'm hoping today's message in chapter 4 encourages us to be more bold about what God's called us to do. <laughs> Jesus once said in Luke chapter 9 to His disciples, He looked at them and said, The harvest is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray you therefore that God will send laborers into the harvest field. So God is still asking the same thing of us as His disciples today. That we're both praying and that we're going into the harvest field. To those who are lost and dying and separated from God. And bringing them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we exist as a church. Our purpose is to help people find their why. Amen? We are here to help people to find why do they exist? Why are they here? Why has God created them? Why do they have breath in their lungs and a heart that beats? Well, number one is to know God. To know Him as their personal Lord and Savior. To enter into the storyline of divinity where God wants to write us into His narrative of redemption. And after we come into that relationship with Christ, is to be involved in the ministry of the Lord. Amen? To know God and to enjoy Him forever. The only way we can enjoy God forever is how? By serving and faithful to Him. Both in this life, in the here and now, and in the hereafter. We begin that process of living boldly and confidently for the Lord. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 9. He's still saying it today. Christians need to be a witness with boldness, not blandness. Now, boldness does not mean arrogance. Boldness does not mean rudeness. Boldness does not mean being obnoxious. Boldness simply means having confidence and having courage. Amen? Yeah. That means that we live a bold life. We are confident. We're staking our life on the claims of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That we're saying that the Bible is the foundation for everything that I'm going to think and do it's going to be the dictator of how I live my life. I'm going to do things God's way. I'm going to obey God if I'm the only person obeying God. Amen? Are you yeah. willing to say that? Yeah. Are you willing to say, even if everybody else turns their back on Jesus, I'm going to stay the course. That's boldness, my friends. And then at some point, you have to be willing to open your mouth and boldly proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel. It's good to live a Christian life, but at some point, the Bible says you must proclaim the name of Jesus. Amen? Now that's not just for the preachers. That's not just for the missionaries. That's for every born again child of God. We're called to be His witnesses. That we live and we speak the truth of the gospel. Now our confidence does not come from our self-motivation or self-talk. or building our own selves up. Our boldness comes from confidence in only the subject that we are so bold and confident in, as well as the great need around us. Because the need is great, it prompts us to be bold. And then the message that we preach, for which we stake our lives on, we know that it's so true, that we're willing to live fully yielded to that reality. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said it this way. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and to salvation for everyone who believes. The Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was not ashamed. Amen. We ought not be ashamed either. We should be bold and confident in Jesus Christ and the word of the gospel. 
Last week we investigated how God used Peter and John to heal the lame beggar. The spectacle of this man walking and leaping and praising God drew a crowd of people. Peter saw this as an opportunity to boldly preach and proclaim the gospel. This drew the attention of the religious and civic leaders. Peter quickly turned this investigation on the religious leaders and actually put them on trial. We're going to look at this in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 through 23. We have a lot of ground to cover today, so I'll preach fast if you listen fast. Amen? Amen. You got a deal? Okay, here we go. Begin in verse 1. It says this, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came up on them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody till the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. You remember Pentecost? 3,000. The second time that Peter preached, two more thousand. The church is now a 5,000-member church. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, by what name, have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, and that was the lame beggar beside of us, he comes to make up residence, to take hold. But the filling of the Holy Spirit needs to happen on a continual basis. Like a sponge, right? A sponge filled up with water. It's always going to be moist and wet, but it gets wrung out to be used for purposes, then filled back up to be used again. Amen? That's what you are with the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You do not have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You are not a child of God. Romans says that. But the question is, are the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit active and controlling your life? Friends, I'll tell you this. The moment you were saved, you got all the Holy Spirit. The question now is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Amen? Are you being yielded and controlled and led by the Holy Spirit in your life? Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is uh, disgrace, but be filled with the Spirit. We all know what a DUI is, right? Driving under the influence. We need to live LUI, living under the influence. Not of alcohol, but of the Holy Spirit of God. Reminds me of a police officer who pulled a guy over, got out, began to talk with him, and the guy who was trying to get out of the ticket said, Sir, I'm a juggler. I work for the circus. I'm trying to rush to get down there. And the cop said, Okay, we have to prove that one to me. Seems a little far fetched. So he got the juggler out. He said, oh, I have all my items in the back in my trunk. The cop said, Okay, show me what you mean by that. So he got the items out. His juggling items and began to juggle five items at one time. Pretty impressive stuff. And all of a sudden the cop looked back and this guy swerved in behind his cruiser, got out of his car, walked over, got in the front seat of the police officer's car, got handcuffs out, put them on himself, and got in the back seat of the police car. The cop came over and said, uh, why did you do that for? He said, sir, if that's your field sobriety test, I could pass it if I was so. <laughs> Are you living under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God in your life? It's, it Just like alcohol changes the way we talk. Changes the way we look. You can tell when someone's drunk, right? You can see it in their face. You can see it in the way they walk. You can see it in the way they talk. It changes their perspective. It changes their opinions. It changes their attitudes. That's what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do in our life. That's why it says, don't be controlled, don't be drunk with wine, but filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to have that kind of control over your life. And when you do, you can live and speak boldly. The main requirement is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's two simple things. It's not mystical or magical. It's a simple equation. Number one, be clean. Be confessed up. Keep short accounts with God. Understand God doesn't expect us to have a perfect vessel, but He doesn't expect us to be confessed up. 
that we're pursuing. Their heart is turned towards Him. Understand that we can trust God fully and completely. The question is, can He trust you? Can He trust me? If God wants to use us, does He have the freedom to do so in our lives? Are we walking close to Jesus? And the second thing is simply being yielded. Allowing Him, allowing Him to have that control of your life. One of my daily prayers, I pray almost every day when I do my devotions, I simply pray, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's simple. It's reminding me that I need the Holy Spirit's filling in my life. And you do as well. Ask God daily, fill me with the Spirit. Be confessed up, walking close with Him and saying, God, I say yes to you, even before knowing all the details. God, you have the agenda of my day. You've got the agenda of my life. Whatever you want me to do, God, I will do it. And you will empower me to be able to do so boldly. Amen? Amen. Alright. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you're walking with Jesus, you're going to be going Jesus' way. Number two, that was the first one, a bold witness and filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, a bold witness are committed to obeying God rather than man. Obeying God rather than man. We see that in verses 18 through 20. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in sight of God, and this uh, sight to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Obey God rather than man. Guys, mark it down. You can guarantee it in life you're going to face opposition and persecution if you're following Jesus. Amen? It's going to happen. Don't be surprised by like a boxer. The boxer can face the punches that they're prepared for and they're defending against. It's the sucker punch that will knock them out. Amen? So if you are not ready, if you're not, pretend, you're not anticipating there's going to be some opposition to your faith, then you're going to feel the punch. But if you know it's coming, you can brace yourself for it. Amen? If it's identifiable, it's preventable. Understand that there's going to be opposition if you're living boldly. That shouldn't be a surprise. The lie from the pit of hell is this. That if you just live faithfully for God, He will protect you from all pain and all persecution. Friends, that's a big fat wrong. That's not the way it happens. Just think about all through the Bible. You have Jesus of your heart, then you can be right with God. But the Bible doesn't give us that opportunity. John 14, 6 says that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So my question to you today is this. Have you come to the Father boldly through Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in Jesus as your only way to